Okay, so now continuing on from functions and anonymous functions and assignment forms, let's look at type declaration. Now, looking at the circumference function, you can see here that we're only doing a math operation, right? This R gets passed, it does some math and returns X. So we can say confidently that R is most likely gonna be some number. Now, if we knew for sure it was gonna be an integer, we can write int 64, and we knew that the user's only gonna pass integers to this, or let's say we want to cover floats, so we'll pass floats to it, or let's say we wanna cover all of them, and we'll write reals. So this is a type declaration. You can see I wrote two colons, and I wrote real, and I can do the same thing for the C up here as well. Real, do that. If I run it again, that's fine. And I'm going to take off the comments out that that part. Okay. So what this does is it tells the compiler that this variable is for sure a real, and then real covers floats and ints which speeds up processes because now it knows that it's not gonna be dealing with a string or a char or a boolean or any other type. It knows for sure it has to be a real and it's gonna start doing math and it just it allows the compiler to figure things out more quickly. And the same thing over here. So it's definitely a way to write your functions if you wanna be clear to the computer, but also being clear to other users because if other people see this, they know, oh, this is going to be some number being passed. And I, I wrote only reals because I'm also confident that no one would be passing a complex number to this. But if I wanted to cover everything, I would write number. Okay, so that's the type declaration. And you can do that for any number of arguments. If we had another argument x, and this was going to be an int 64, and then we had a y, and this is gonna be a vector, and so on and so forth. I'm gonna just delete all that though. Okay, now besides type declaration, there's also different types of arguments that you can give to functions. So these, these are your standard arguments. R is a real, we pass R and does stuff with it. Let's write another function. I'm going to write a function u and call m h and then semicolon g. And then in here, we do m times g times h and end. Comment these lines out. And I'm gonna call you and just give it 10, 10, and 10. Okay, so you can see there's some difference with how I wrote this. You can see I wrote a semicolon here. And you can see here, I just wrote three arguments. Now this is gonna give me an error. All right, and there's our error. No method matching u, int, int, int. Closest candidates is the other u that we wrote, which is any, any, and then the semicolon g. So this is a keyword argument, the semicolon g. And what this is saying is I have to explicitly call g. So g equals this. It won't be mad at this output. You can see that it did that math fine. And you still see the squiggly here. I think that's something that just Visual Studio does, and it's saying that there's an error here, but really it's fine. I can also put a semicolon right there if I want to be more explicit and it's still going to produce the same result. So a keyword argument is an argument that you, you call by its keyword, which in this case is just G. And 10 and 10, it knows these are the default arguments M and H, or not default, the arguments M and H. And then I call G by its keyword and gave it that. Now, let's get more explicit. So we already learned about this. 
call this a real, call G a real. And now let's say we know for sure we're working in Earth for the most part. So G is gonna have a default of 10. And I'm gonna delete all this. And now you can see U is gonna just be called with two arguments. It still produced a thousand. So now what I'm doing is I'm doing the type declaration, but I also have G as a keyword, but also as a default argument. And its default is 10. So unless I give it a third parameter, this will always just be 10. So it knows to treat this as 10, and then we do M times G times H. So let's say I now am working on a different planet and it has a much heavier gravity. Now it has a thousand. Oh, and I got the error because I didn't call G explicitly. There you go. Okay. And now in this case, it's not taking this 10 value. We pass G explicitly. We're saying, hey, use this gravity instead and do this operation, return this, and then that's what gets outputted. Yeah. So that is a default argument. So it's good for cases that you know for the most part it's going to be using this number. So I'm just going to leave it the default. But then there is a possible chance that the user or you need to give it something else. So you allow that option. Now let's look at the other type of argument, which is the variable argument. So I'm going to call add x call x a real and then we're going to have y dot 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 and end and what this is going to return is x plus sum of y comment that out and i'm going to have two print lines we're going to first do add a four comma five and then I'm going to do print line of add four, actually I'll call it five, 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 five. Okay, run this again. All right, so we got two outputs in this case, and they both worked. So add, you can see here, we giving it a real, and then we're giving this y dot 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 which these dots is the variable argument, or they also call it var args, but it's a variable argument. And what that means is this is an argument of arbitrary size. So you just, you're, you're passing tons of arguments to this function and you don't know how many arguments may be passed. So I'm just gonna leave this arbitrary and it will just grow with however many variables are passed. So in here, I just did four and five, and it did that math pretty simply. I did x plus the summation of y, and did that, and now put it nine. But then here, you can see I still passed x, but I passed several arguments, and it still is able to handle that, because it treated y as this container, and put it in the sum, summed them all up, and outputted that. So it's good, it's good for an arbitrary size, and you can see it was able to handle it. Okay. And now one last thing, which isn't directly with functions, but it's good because now we're writing with functions is cons. Now I mentioned this at the beginning of the first video, but let's say we have a const and let's say we have a pi variable and our pi is way more accurate than the Julia pi and we want to use that. So we declare this const pi. So this is a variable that can't be changed. It's, it's our constant, it's always going to be 3.14, and we're going to use that for now on. Now, when you're using a const, it's good to declare it with const, because if you just leave it as pi, then the compiler is going to think this variable may be changed in the future, and it makes it more inefficient. But if it knows that it's const, then it will always treat it as oh, this variable can't be changed, it's going to leave it as its data type, and it knows for sure that it's just going to be used in math. 
And because this is in the global scope, you can see it's outside any functions, then everyone else has access to it. If I declared it within this function, then only this function would have access to it. But now pi is given to, or now has access to all these other variables or functions. And then here, I want to use pi here because my pi is way better than Julia's pi. And then call, oh, well, I should uncomment those lines. And there you go. So you can see the first one is circumference, and it's now using this pi variable, and this is const. And then the other one's called c of r, which that's using Julia's pi, which you can see is actually way more accurate because it has more values of precision than me just using 3.14. But const is good if you have tons of different constants that you're going to be using. Let's say you have the gravitational constant, using Avogadro's number, using all these other numbers that you know don't change. You're, it's good to declare them as cons because then the compiler knows how to deal with them and it makes the code a lot more efficient than leaving it as a variable that can be changed. Now that's the end of this part for functions. The next video is going to go into structs and we're still going to be talking more about functions, but It'll be primarily focused on structs and now using functions for the structures and then we'll be going to modules so i'll see you there